If Asquith was an elderly romantic and possibly a lecher, Lloyd George was a notorious goat. Lord Kitchener used to say that he objected to discussing sensitive military matters in front of the cabinet because they all went home and told their wives. Except for Lloyd George, who went home and told somebody else's wife. But like Murray Stokes, most people were still comparatively ignorant about sex. In the course of her research, Stokes came to the conclusion that her husband was impotent. To get a divorce, however, she'd have to prove it. In May 1914, she underwent a medical examination that certified her virginity. And the marriage was annulled. Mary Stopes wrote about her traumatic experiences of love, sex and marriage in the pioneering book Married Love. She was the first to write about sexual intercourse in a matter-of-fact way. We tend to think of women's lib as a 1970s thing, but it was also one of the growing intellectual movements of Edwardian life. Just after 6 a.m. on the 19th of February, 1913, there was an explosion at Lloyd George's new house, still under construction near his golf club at Walton-on-the-Hill in Surrey. The servants' wing was badly damaged. The ceilings ruined, doors and windows blown out. The bombs were simple canisters filled with gunpowder and the timing device, very crude, simply a lighted candle stuck on top of a paraffin-soaked rag. No note was found, but the police did discover two broken hat pins and in the road outside, one woman's shoe. The main culprit was a gawky, rather awkward young redhead called Emily Wilding Davison. Within a few months, her name would echo round the world. But for now, Responsibility was taken on behalf of the whole suffragette movement by Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst. Speaking that very night in Cardiff, she said, We may not yet have got the whole government in prison, but we have blown up the Chancellor of the Exchequer's house. Now, some people booed and one protester said, Why have you blown him up? To which Mrs. Pankhurst replied, To wake him up. Laughter, applause and hooting of horns. Even radical liberals like Lloyd George still drew the line at votes for women. On both sides, the struggle became more intense. Hunger strikes, forced feeding, windows smashed, paintings slashed, post boxes burned and telegraph links brought down. And sweet-looking little old ladies terrorising the authorities by applying for gun licences. Next target, the social event of the year, Derby Day in Epsom. Emily Davison arrived at Epsom by railway, made her way to the racecourse and then marked up her card, waiting for the all-important three o'clock race when the King's horse, Anma, would be running. The race was a flat sprint. As the horses turned into the final straight, Anma was running in third from last position. Emily Davison slipped underneath the barrier one of the bystanders tried to grab her, but he said later that she shook herself free and cried, I will, and then she strode straight into the path of the king's horse. The horse hit Emily Davison with colossal force. She fell and rolled over two or three times, then lay unconscious. 
film footage shows her grabbing the reins. Some believe she was trying to pin a banner on the horse. Davison was taken to hospital. Hate mail was to follow. This being Britain, more concern was expressed for the horse, which survived. Emily Wilding Davison didn't. On the 8th of June, 1913, four days after her protest, she died of terrible internal injuries. At the funeral, her coffin was draped in a suffragette flag. Thousands of men and women lined the streets as it passed. The coffin was flanked by women dressed in the colors of the suffrage movement. Green for hope, purple for dignity, and white for purity. Rebel women and rebel girls smashed the complacent face of Edwardian Britain and changed the image of this country around the world, no longer the stuffy, narrow, unchanging society. The suffragettes turned Emily Davidson quite deliberately into an international martyr, impossible to ignore and unforgettable. What she did to herself here was horrible. But what happened to her after her death was everything she hoped for. Attacked by militant women and challenged by socialist strikes, Asquith now made another, even more dangerous enemy. For more than a generation, the Liberals had been committed to loosening Britain's grip on Ireland with a form of devolution or home rule. But they'd always been angrily opposed by the Protestant majority in Ulster. In April 1912, Asquith tried again. Under the leadership of the lawyer and QC, Sir Edward Carson, the Ulster Unionists started organizing fellow Protestants and the Tories were with him. At a vast meeting here in Belfast, Edward Carson challenged the crowd to raise their hands and declare that never under any circumstances will we submit to home rule. Even the leader of the Conservative Party, standing beside Carson, raised his hand as well. And then they set out to get the entire Unionist population of Northern Ireland to sign an oath of resistance, not just with speeches and pens, but if necessary, bullets and bayonets too. This oath was called the Ulster Covenant, and in the end, nearly half a million people signed it, including a man called Fred Crawford, who, to show his dedication to the cause, signed in his own blood. In January 1913, the Unionists formed the Ulster Volunteer Force to defend the northern counties of Ireland against British attempts to enforce home rule. Some 100,000 men joined up, armed with half a dozen machine guns and 50,000 rifles, mainly smuggled from Germany. This wasn't just about Ireland. All across Britain, huge sums of money were being raised for the Unionist cause. 